Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I think people are just starting to join in now. I can see a few few yellow lights turning green, which is good to see. Yep, so they're joining. Hope everyone is having a really great morning. Um, if you can hear us, um, let us know in the chat. We just want to make sure that the, the microphone and the cameras are all working before we get going. Good morning, Laura. Good morning, Haggart. Hey, Haggart. Good morning, Eddie. Good morning, Catherine. It's looking good. <laughs> We're seeing everybody, so that's really nice. Awesome. Also, just a, a big thank you to everyone, particularly as well from um, New South Wales and Victoria. I know that 11 a.m. is often a, a bit of reserved time for most people at the moment. I um, uh, just want to let you know that, you know, thank you for joining. And, um, you know, hopefully we will bring a little bit more fun and entertainment than what's usually on at 11 a.m. <laughs> I think we'll wait a couple, probably one or two more minutes just for um, a couple of the stragglers to join in and then we'll probably get this show on the road. Also, good morning to anyone that's made it from Western Australia as well at 9 a.m. first thing in the morning. Um, good to see anyone here across the country. Yep, Luke's saying all good. Everyone's saying it's working well. This is good. Um, just as well for everybody that's joined so far, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, my name's Jack and I've got Jim with me as well, um, one of our civil engineers. We will have our cameras on for the start of the webinar. Um, then we'll actually turn them off because this will actually allow the presentation um, to fill up your screen. Just means that you'll be able to see everything a little bit better. Um, as well as that, if you're still having a little bit of trouble um, seeing the slides, you can also pop out the chat um, by hitting the button in the top right, the little square with the arrow, and that should also mm -hmm. enlarge um, the slides as well for you. Yeah, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to put up a quick poll uh, to see who's uh, who's been here before who's and who's been here before, yeah, and who's fresh, because this is our second episode of the webinar. So we had um, an episode two months ago. We run these every second month, um, the last Wednesday of every second month. Um, so keep an eye out for the next episode as well. Uh, but it's good to see a bit of an even split. But I think that being said, we've got almost 70 people here. Um, so I'm inclined to get the ball rolling um, and, you know, get into it. So I think, I think I'm going to do exactly that, Jim. All right, sounds <laughs> and, good. Um, and as people join, they can sort of, they can uh, strut into this sort of first five minutes of introduction. Um, so welcome everybody to the Think Brick Australia second episode of our architectural webinar series. Um, and today we're going to be looking at hit and miss screens. Um, before we dive into that, I'm going to go through a little bit about who we are at ThinkBrick and, you know, what our goals and our vision is. So we're a peak body that represents Australia's clay brick and paver manufacturers. And essentially, we want to make it easier to build in brick, block and pavers. Um, and we want to do this by facilitating those important conversations within the industry, um, developing talent and innovation, and as well as promoting our members' products um, and the different ways that they can be used um, in really successful projects Australia-wide. So how do we do this? So we've got a couple of key strategies um, and engagement projects that we have here at ThinkBrick um, to, in order to facilitate our vision. Um, so the most popular one that you may have heard of is our ThinkBrick Awards. Uh, good morning, Gary, joining in. Um, so our Think Brick Awards every year, we actually celebrate um, architectural excellence with using our members' products um, through the promotion of bricks, concrete, masonry, as well as roof tiles. Um, and this is where you'll see a lot of today's projects come from as well. Um, on top of this as well, we obviously conduct research um, on a technical side of things as to how uh, brick might be used in different technical situations. Um, and we're always promoting member engagement, you know, getting our manufacturers involved with their projects, with architects, engineers, um, and, you know, promoting that talent with the industry. So essentially, we're all about knowledge, we're all about learning, and we're all about sharing that knowledge. Um, so I would advise you all to, you know, sit in, 
have a listen and you know if you have any questions uh, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll be sure to answer them as best we can um, on top of this, just on brand with the Think Brick Awards, we have recently announced our top 40 finalists for this year on our Instagram page. Um, so I think Jim's going to unleash a poll um, on who is following us on social media. I would encourage you all to follow us on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, as well as Spotify, which I'll touch on in a second. Um, just to, you know, get a bit of inspiration on what's happening in the world of bricks. Um, in Australia and worldwide. So again, as I mentioned before, we're a big proponent for knowledge sharing. So if you're ever in need of technical manuals, research papers, case studies, um, or you have a question for us, feel free to give us a call or um, send us an email um, and we'll be sure to answer it as best we can. So in terms of socials as well, we have recently launched our Think Brick podcast um, where we actually talk to famous Australian architects about some of their projects, about their upbringing, as well as some technical information as well. Um, so you can see, I'm sure you'll all be familiar with some of these names on the screen, uh, Amy Muir, Neil Durbach, Rachel Neeson, Koichi Takata, um, as well as many other Australian architects. I think our most recent episode was with Andrew Hageman. Um, so I would encourage you all to check that out, give that a listen, um, and you know, learn something new about you know, how these architects might approach some of their projects. And again, as I mentioned, we represent um, Australia's brick, clay brick and paper manufacturers. Um, and this is just a bit of a list of some of those manufacturers um, that we represent on a national state uh, and a regional level, as well as some of our associate and international members as well. Um, so a big shout out to any of our members that are actually here today as well. Thank you for coming along and joining. Um, and yeah, thank you for sitting in and you know seeing what's possible with your products. So myself and Jim here, we are both graduate engineers here at ThinkBrick. Um, essentially, our role is to develop and review technical documents, make sure they're up to date with current trends, um, assist with technical inquiries, you know, answer those questions that you might have about your projects, um, and organize engagements um, with architects, engineers like yourselves, um, like today's webinar. So what should you get out of this series? Essentially, running this series, we want to share our knowledge with what we are seeing happening in the industry with regards to design and construction. Um, and share, you know, how you might become inspired and how you might tackle these more complex projects that you might have. And by sharing some of these previous Think Brick Award winners, you know, we want to help inspire you to use clay brick and pavers and blocks um, to create the very best projects you can envision. So again, if you have any questions or comments, uh, we'd love to hear them in the chat or um, on email as well afterwards. So a bit of what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to cover what a hit and miss wall is, some of the structural considerations you might need to take into account, um, how you might design and support hit and miss walls, as well as some of the patterns um, that you can actually employ with these walls. Again, how to detail them effectively um, so that they'll remain durable um, over their lifetime. Then Jim's going to run through some of the benefits, um, some I'm sure you're already aware of, some less known. Um, and then right at the end here, we're going to go through two really great case studies um, from previous award winners here. We're going to go through Garden Wall House by Studio Bright uh, and GB House by Renato Diator Architects. Um, so I think we're going to turn off our cameras now um, just so we can make the slides a little bit bigger for you. Perfect. I think that, that seemed to have worked on my end. Um, all right. So firstly, what is a hit and miss wall? So these go by numerous names uh, in Australia and around the world. They're also known as perforated brickwork, honeycomb brickwork, lattices, brick screens, uh, and even breeze walls. Bit of history, um, hit and miss brick walls sort of originated um, as part of fortifications um, in castles and forts. So the actual gaps in the brickwork and stonework would actually allow um, projectiles to be fired through them. So Obviously, as technology's advanced um, and as artillery has been developed, these have become a little bit more defunct from a defensive standpoint. Uh, but it's really great to see they're coming back um, as a sort of architectural um, and design technique now. 
and you can see some really great projects here, um, some of which will go into further detail as well. So essentially, a hit and miss wall is a wall that is absent of perpend mortar joints. So usually in a regular stretcher bonded wall, you'll see your bed joints, you know, your horizontal mortar joints will be filled with mortar as well as your vertical perpendicular joints. And that's the image you can see on the right hand side there. Obviously with a hit and miss wall there, you'll see that by not filling in those perpend joints and by offsetting those brick um, bricks in each subsequent course, you can actually create a sort of checkerboard lattice work perforated pattern. And again, what this is going to allow for is it's going to allow for air and light to permeate through the screen. So when it comes to how we might approach a hit and miss wall, the first thing we should look at is what bricks and what actual units are going to be the best choice um, for designing these walls. Now, the most popular brick you'll often see around Australia in particular are your cord units. As the name suggests, these are bricks that have cores through the middle, um, as you can see in that picture on the left. Now, these can be used um, in hit and miss brick walls. However, I would urge you to consider how the cores might affect the bedded area of the masonry. What I mean by this is obviously where you have those cores, you're going to have less connection between the bricks and how they're offset from one another. And this can affect the structural performance of your wall. Um, what you can do with cord units is you actually can turn them on their side to actually expose the cores horizontally. Um, and we'll actually go through a project that's actually utilized this design principle uh, later on in the presentation. However, generally we would recommend at ThinkBrick using solid units, as obviously, as the name suggests, this is going to allow for a maximum bedded area, which is going to create a stronger hit and miss wall. On the right hand side, you can see frogged units. These are obviously units that have that recess um, in the top of the brick. These are generally not recommended um, for hit and miss walls because the, the frog or the recess will actually reduce the bedding area um, quite significantly in some cases. Again, you can use all three of these units, but it's worth considering their limitations and their performance. Um, but I think I'm going to palm off to Jim now and he's going to go through some of the structural considerations. Yeah, thanks Jack for that. Um, so yeah, when we're looking at designing a masonry wall structurally, right, what your engineer would usually look at first would be the Australian standards. Um, AS 3700 specifically would be the masonry standard that they would use. Uh, but the thing about AS 3700 is that it only covers masonry that has all its uh, perp end and mortar joints filled, right? Obviously, this is not the case with a hit and miss brick screen where you do have these gaps in your wall. So technically, your hit and miss walls don't exactly fall under the Australian standards. As you can imagine, a hit and miss wall is going to naturally be a little bit weaker than a solid brick wall. And that kind of is intuitive, right? What's going to be stronger, a solid brick wall or a brick wall with holes in it, right? But with some good engineering judgment and some clever architectural design, you can account for these uh, strength uh, considerations. And that's what we're going to be talking about today and giving you different solutions. The reason why brick screens are weaker than a solid brick wall is largely because of how less mortar is used, right? So if you think about, first of all, the bedding area, the bedding joints, the horizontal bedding joints, which we see uh, in the pink highlighted areas, what you have when compared to a solid brick wall is you're gonna have less of that gluing surface area, right? And that's very important. If you also look at the vertical perp and mortar joints, you're gonna see that there's actually gonna be no mortar at all. So when you have less glue and you have less of that surface area binding your wall together, binding your individual units together, your wall is gonna be weaker. That said, if depending on the size of your gaps, 
um, you can make a stronger or a weaker hit and miss wall. If you have smaller gaps with larger overlaps, obviously your wall is going to be a bit stronger and you can have bigger big, uh, brick screens. If you have uh, larger gaps, you might need more structural design. Going back to what I said about AS3700, um, even though the Australian standards technically doesn't cover uh, the structural design of brick screens, what research from the University of Newcastle has shown is that the equations and the formulas in the standards can still accurately predict the strengths and accurately quantify the strengths of a hit and miss brick screen. As long as you do take into account how there is less mortar being used. Um, what the research also showed is that the failure often occurs where the mortar joints are. And again, that's intuitive because you have less mortar uh, doing the same amount of structural work. If anybody um, is designing any type of masonry wall, um, for an engineer, there's going to be two main forces that you're going to consider. Um, there's a question from Peter as uh, asking what mortar strength would be best suited. Um, usually M3 is suitable, um, but sometimes you would use M4 depending on if you're in a coastal area, for example. And the slides will also be available um, in a follow-up email we're going to send after this presentation, Amelia. But with when you're designing any type of masonry wall, there's really two main things you're going to consider structurally. The first thing is your vertical compressive loads, right? So if you have a column, for example, that's holding up a building, that's going to be a load-bearing column when it takes into account the load of the floors above and the people above, for example. For brick screens, we generally don't recommend brick screens be load-bearing. The other thing to consider is your perpendicular forces, or in other words, your out-of-plane forces. This could be as simple as somebody leaning on your wall, or it could be something as common as wind loads. Uh, this would be the main structural consideration when you're designing a hit and miss wall. As you can imagine, if you have a really long spanning wall, it's going to topple more easily, right? So what engineers like to do is they like to put in supports or they like to put in columns every few meters um, to give that wall some structural strength. Because of how a brick screen is a little bit weaker, um, you're going to need columns a little bit more frequently, right? Generally, every one or two meters compared to a solid brick wall, which could span, you know, eight or nine meters. That said, nothing's stopping you from creating larger brick screens. Um, and we're going to show you some of the different options that you can use to overcome some of these limitations. Um, we also have a YouTube video um, showing you some of the calculations and some of the technical work uh, behind how to design a hit and miss wall. And Demu doesn't seem to like me at this moment, so the picture hasn't really shown up, but that's all right. Um, my slides don't seem to be moving. Might be my internet. One second. <laughs> Sorry about this, guys. I might take over for you, Jim, while you're um, connecting there. Oh, I've, I, I, I seem to have it again. Okay, That's perfect. Fine. That's okay. Um, so this should be the engaged peers slide, which yep. hopefully you're seeing. Um, 
Engaged peers is going, probably Jim? one of the more common methods of supporting your brickwork. Um, as I mentioned with brick screens, your wall's going to be a little bit weaker, so your spans aren't going to be as one of the ways you can support your brick screens is by simply putting in columns um, every few meters. And this is what we call engaged peers. This is probably one of the more common methods because it's one of the easier methods for engineers to design and for people to construct as well. Um, sometimes people don't like the idea of having columns breaking up your brick screens um, because they might interrupt the flow of the aesthetic. But as we see from this example from Fulton Trotter Architects using barrel bricks, they've really quite cleverly and quite beautifully incorporated a structural element into the brick screen uh, element as well. So really, there's no reason why you can't be creative in the way uh, how you incorporate your structural columns and your engaged peers. Another option is to use visible steel frames. Um, on the example on the right, as we see from SJB Architects, what they've done is they've taken the hit and miss wall and they've placed it in this little self-contained structural steel frame. This is beneficial compared to your engaged peers because it provides a more minimalistic and a sleeker and a bit more of a modern look um, when you're incorporating your hit and miss screens. It's also a really good opportunity to look at the relationship between your more modern materials of steel and your more traditional materials of clay brick. I think we might have lost Jim. Sorry about that, guys. My internet's a bit dodgy. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, here's another really fantastic example of visible. Yeah, I think we might have lost Jim. I think um, we might let Jim reconnect, but I'll take over the reins from here. I apologize, everybody. I think we've all experienced the, um, the, the lows and highs of working from home at the moment. Um, but moving on from what Jim said, um, and I'll, I'll wait for him to jump back in in a second. Um, on top of the previous project we've seen with the visible steel frames, um, it's also been used around the world. Um, so you can see a great example here in Iran where they've actually used a prefabricated steel screen here um, to allow the brickwork to be suspended out from the building. So if you're looking to create a sort of suspended hit and miss screen, this is another option that you might want to look at as well. Conversely, you might choose to hide your steel frame. Um, and the main reason you might choose to do this is to actually allow for the illusion of longer spans of hit and miss brickwork. So by actually hiding your structural frame behind the brickwork, um, from the outside, it will actually look like you have this continuous, uninterrupted uh, lattice work within your brickwork, which is going to give a really nice lightness to an otherwise really heavy material. So it's a really nice juxtaposition of how you might want to choose to use clay brick. Um, and that you can see here, this is a great example, um, the Fish Creek House by Addition Office. They've actually, um, if you look at the left-hand photo, it appears to have these really long you know, four to six meter spans of brickwork um, in that lattice screen. But you can see on the right hand side, they've actually got those supporting steel piers um, cleverly hidden behind the actual bricks where they touch um, and where their bedding uh, joints touch. And again, taking this to another level um, and taking it onto an international uh, stage as well, 
you can actually see this is an elevator uh, in Spain that's actually used the same idea um, by having this hidden steel frame as well. So you can see that on the right-hand side image, once again, this looks almost like a tall tower of uninterrupted hit and miss brickwork. Um, but you can see there on the left-hand side, you can actually see those steel frames being tied into the brickwork at every uh, 10th or 11th course. Um, and as I mentioned before at the beginning of the presentation, oh, okay, Teresa says the slides are not matching. Is everyone seeing a slide with um, an elevator on it? Okay, yep. Sorry, Teresa. Yeah, I think that so might be just a bit of lag on your end. I apologize. I think Demio is really not being our friend today. Um, but again, you can see here how this steel frame is actually tying into these brickworks, as, into the brickwork itself. Um, and you'll actually also notice that the cores for these bricks have been turned horizontally, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So this is another um, decision you might choose to make with these cord bricks to, you know, allow for further perforations in your hit and miss brick wall. And I think the advantage of having a system here for this elevator shaft is you can actually imagine yourself, you know, moving up and down in the elevator itself and sort of seeing the light outside the shaft, you know, come in through these perforations, um, almost like a moving pattern. So from an experience point of view, you can create a really nice playful atmosphere with how you might choose to use hit and miss steel frames. Um, and Jim, if you're back, I might let you take off again. Yeah, thanks for the save, Jack. Um, here, here we have an example of um, inbuilt supports, which is another uh, solution which you may consider when looking at how to support your brick screens. Um, in this example on the left, the Lipton Taya House in Chicago, in Illinois, um, what the final support system that was actually used was actually a brick veneer, which we see on the left. But one of the initial solutions that was proposed was an inbuilt support system, which we see on the right, where they've proposed threading some steel post through the brick itself. And here we have an image of the final uh, project, seeing how these bricks twist and turn, how these columns play with light in this interesting way, whilst providing a layer of privacy for this residential building. Um, if you're interested in another project that uses inbuilt supports, I would highly recommend checking out the Admin Studio um, in Spain, which uses a similar system. Lastly, we have Breeze Blocks, which is a really good option for creating brick screens easily whilst having a really strong structural benefit. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the main reason why brick screens are weaker than your normal solid brickwork is because of that reduced mortar gluing surface area, right? With breeze blocks, that's essentially not an issue and you can create really large, really long spanning brick screens, which is really quite beautiful, as we see in this, in this example from Bennett Murata Architects. Um, I just want to point out that a lot of our members create a, create a lot of really fantastic products um, of breeze blocks, both uh, from ThinkBrick and the Concrete Masonry Association. So not just clay, right? Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass back off to Jack and he's going to show you, you know, different laying patterns um, and different techniques that you can use to, to add different textural elements to your Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, so now that we've gone through the engineering stuff, let's get into the fun stuff now, which is the design um, elements of a hit and miss wall and how we might actually choose to stack our bricks to create different um, visual appeal and different looks. 
Um, so let's firstly start off with this project here, Turak House um, by Inglis Architecture. So they've actually used these really nice white uh, new bricks. Um, and what they've done is they've stacked them in a manner where the bedding joints have remained consistent um, through each subsequent course of brickwork. And so what this creates is it creates a really nice symmetrical, um, almost checkerboard pattern of alternating hit and miss brickwork. Um, and this really nice symmetrical nature, you know, allows the brickwork to be quite simple, but yet so effective um, in the visual appeal it gives. And you can see, obviously, whilst it might look simple um, from the diagram on the right hand side, and whilst it might look a little bit elementary um, in the manner that it's stacked, you can see in the photo on the left hand side that it has such a great effect in sort of creating this additional, you know, textural element to the front facade of this house. Again, from an engineering standpoint as well, um, stacking the bricks in this manner with consistent bedding area um, also makes the calculations a little bit easier as well, um, as you can sort of uh, estimate the actual flexural capacity and the strength of the wall due to the fact that the bedding is consistent in each course of brickwork. Uh, moving on now, we're actually going to see an application of hit and miss brickwork um, in the interior of a house. So this is the Car Place Residence by Klopper and Davis Architects. Um, and they've actually used Roman bricks um, from Austral Bricks to create this screen. And now if you were in our first webinar, we would have we went through the different types of masonry units, um, the different sizes. So these Roman bricks are obviously um, shorter and higher in height, which gives them a sort of more sleek, thin profile. And what they've actually done here with this hit and miss screen is they've double stacked two courses of brickwork, then offset that with a single course of brickwork. The effect of this, of course, is that they've created these more square shaped openings in their hit and miss brickwork. Um, so obviously you can see in the photo on the left, they've got a sort of vertical course of square perforations followed adjacently by a sort of thinner rectangular perforation. Um, on top of this, they've actually created the wall two bricks wide. So what I mean by this is they've actually laid two courses of brickwork um, into this wall. And the advantage of this is that it creates sort of more of a shadowed and a deeper look to your hit and miss wall. Um, and in an interior space like this, it has the added benefit of not only separating these spaces, um, but it also has the added acoustic benefits while still being quite porous in nature. So it's a great way of defining spaces in the interior of a home or in the interior of a, a commercial building as well, while still allowing um, some you know, transition between these zones. Um, and it's good to see, we've posted that poll, it's good to see a bit of variation in what people, um, appear, what sort of support systems appeal to people. It's great to see that variety. Um, particularly from a design standpoint. Uh, moving on now, this is the Aperture House from Cox Rayner Architects as well as Twofold Studio. Um, and they've used these really nice sandy colored barrel bricks to create this hit and miss screen. And what you'll immediately see um, in this brick screen is that you'll see that the perforations are stacked directly on top of one another um, in the manner of how they've stacked the bricks. However, what's a little bit more striking and a little bit more unique about this pattern is that you'll also see um, that where the bricks would otherwise butt up to one another on those alternating courses, you'll actually see that the architects and the builders there have left a 10 millimeter per pen joint gap, which would otherwise be filled with mortar. So they've actually mimicked the same dimension of the per pen joint um, but they've actually still created these really, really narrow openings as well um, to sort of further enhance and complement the look of the hit and miss screen. The other thing they've done here once again is that they've turned some of the bricks to expose their header face. So again, this is that sort of shorter, um, thinner face of the brick as opposed to the stretcher face, which is what you'll normally see in most masonry construction. And what they've again done is they've stacked this wall two bricks wide. Um, as you can see the image on the right hand side, it's 230 mils wide. And this has allowed them to turn those bricks without having to cut them. So again, 
if you're looking to create a hit and miss wall and you're thinking about turning um, the bricks to expose different faces and, you know, have a bit of a play around with the different dimensions of the brick itself, you might consider um, stacking your brickwork two leaves wide, which actually, again, saves um, construction efficiency and saves time on needing to cut the bricks as well. Moving on to a slightly more um, wild example. This is the six on six project by Tridente Architects. Um, and what they've actually done here again is they've taken that idea from Aperture House where they've turned the bricks on their side to expose their header face. And they've gone with that idea and taken it a step further. And you can see that they've actually alternated these stretcher faces in a random manner, which creates these sort of random scattered look um, with the hit and miss wall. And again, this is a hit and miss brickwork that opens up to a balcony. So you get this really nice um, trade-off between privacy, um, but also still allowing this really nice dappled, randomly scattered light to enter the space. And again, um, as I've said in the past two slides, they've stacked these bricks um, in two leaves, which again means that the header bricks that they've exposed don't need to be cut. And once again, it creates that deeper, um, more shadowed look within your hit and miss brickwork. Um, so again, this is quite a creative example and it's a little bit more difficult um, to achieve from a design and construction standpoint. Um, but this is where we would advise, you know, construction CAD drawings um, to be supplied to, you know, assist with the construction of these walls. Going on now to a slightly even more crazy example. Um, this is by Fratel Group for the actual Brickworks Design Studio itself. So the aim of this project was to showcase some of the potential of this of Brickworks actual products. So what they've done here is they've not only used different brick sizes and different um, faces, but they've actually used different colors as well. So again, you're not limited to just the pattern itself of your brickwork. You're not limited just to the support system. You can have a play around with color and you can have a play around with the size of your bricks um, to create something even more visually striking. Um, because regardless of what you think about this wall, it's immediately going to draw your eye to it as well. So now we're going to go into a little bit more detail with AM60 um, by BBN. So this project you'll immediately see is first of all, really large in scale. Um, but second of all, the actual perforations themselves are quite large. They're actually five courses high. Um, so this is actually a large 20 story high rise building in Brisbane. And the idea of the brickwork itself was to respond to the characteristic um, of the older buildings across the road. So the architects actually chose to use these really nice you know, off white barrel bricks to respond to a building across the road. So the immediate question that you might ask is how was it done? So obviously when you're looking at a building of this scale, the bricks themselves are not going to be able to support their own weight over multiple floors. So what the architects and engineers decided upon was to use shelf angles to support each level of brickwork. So what this means is obviously at every level, at every slab of the building, they've actually installed a steel shelf angle, um, which will actively support the next level of brickwork. So as Jim mentioned before, you might need to divide your brickwork into different sections. And by using a shelf angle, you can actually divide these into different discrete sections on a level by level basis. The other thing that they've also done is they've used bed joint reinforcing as well um, in every stretcher bonded course. So wherever there was no perforations and no gaps in the brickwork, they've actually further reinforced the mortar joints um, with bed joint, with steel bed joint reinforcing, which again allows the brickwork to work at a higher level. And on top of this, obviously shelf angles and bed joint reinforcing alone are not going to support brickwork over six or seven floors, particularly when the spans are as long as they were in that first photo you might have seen. So the other thing the architects and engineers worked together on was to create these structural columns that are hidden behind the hit and miss brickwork. 
So from the outside, once again, you don't actually see how the wall is being supported and it creates that really nice illusion of solid brickwork. However, from the inside, you actually have these steel beams working really hard to actually continuously support um, the large spans of brickwork. And obviously, as you can see through this scan, um, they're cleverly hidden behind the perforations so that they're not actually seen from the outside. And I'll give you a bit more of an idea of what this looks like. This is actually an interior shot of the building. And you can actually see that behind this brickwork, behind this sort of curtain facade wall is actually six or seven floors of glass clad office and conference rooms. So the brickwork allows to sort of give that bit of privacy and give that shielding from the sun while still allowing for so much light to come into the space. You know, you can see through this photo um, how light the interior space seems and you can see that dappled light um, radiating even off the floor of the building. Um, and more importantly, if you look closely there um, where the arrows are, you can see those structural steel frames um, vertically going up the brickwork, supporting it. Um, Peter did ask a great question. How does the design prevent from getting approvals due to gaps um, because people can climb on them? Yep, so this is again a case of using a perforated brick wall in the right location. So obviously, um, if you're using a, a hit and miss screen on the ground floor, there needs to be some sort of consideration as to how or why it might be climbed by an individual, which is why you will more commonly see hit and miss walls on upper floors of a building. Um, so again, this is on a case by case basis, um, but it is worth considering that obviously the gaps do allow um, for footholds, which does in occasion make them unsuitable um, for ground floor applications. And that's why you'll commonly see them as feature elements on buildings as well. Depending on the size of the gap as well, depending on the overlap of your units, this can also influence the overall design of your hit and miss wall. Um, if you're able to create gaps that are small enough that they're unclimbable or that they will not be able to be used as footholds, um, then this can also influence the design as well. But as Jim mentioned, um, hit and miss walls are not covered in AS 3700, nor are they really mentioned in the National Construction Code either. Um, so this can also be a bit of a grey area, which is why it is sort of a case by case basis. Tamara also asks, how do you clean the windows behind the screens? That's another really great question. A lot of the time, there's sort of a bit of a recess section um, between the hit and miss brickwork and the windows. Um, I'll show you a really good example um, in a little bit tomorrow um, with GB House and with Studio Bright. But in a lot of applications, there's almost a balcony sort of space or a recess behind these brickworks that allows them to be cleaned in a more effective manner. I know in some situations there have been cases where it is really difficult to get in behind these windows, but I think a lot of good design um, these days will actually allow a bit of a recess between the actual perforation and between the window. Um, but getting to that, it's a relevant question when it comes to detailing as well, in terms of the way that hit and miss walls work. Um, obviously, hit and miss walls are porous in nature, um, and it means that water will get in behind the walls, particularly, you know, as Tamara mentions, if you need to clean the windows, which is a really great question. This also means that water is going to get behind these walls into that recessed area. Um, and if you know the characteristics and properties of clay bricks, you'll know that they act a little bit like a sponge. So this means that they actively absorb water over time. And this becomes a problem. Obviously, we don't want water in our structure. Um, that's really not a great thing, and it's going to cause problems immediately, but also over time as well. So what this means is you need to detail your hit and miss wall effectively as well. Um, obviously, the most effective way to do this, if you see this property here, York Street by Jackson Clements Burrows, um, they've used these barrel bricks here for their hit and miss screen. But obviously, you can see they've got five or six courses of stretcher bonded brickwork below the screen um, where it actually interfaces with the first floor slab. 
So what they've actually done is they've allowed for weep holes and flashing to redirect the moisture out of the wall. Um, and this will be done in compliance with AS 3700, um, as well as our manuals. We have manuals available which sort of show the diagrams of how you might effectively detail these walls. Um, and it remains the same as a regular stretcher bonded brick wall. Not a lot has to change um, from the perspective of flashing and weep holes. And you can see this drawing on the left hand side here. Um, this is a cavity brick system, but the principles remain the same. Where you will have this interface between the slab and the brickwork, um, if you've got a hit and miss wall above that sort of recess space, you will need to have flashing and weep holes to redirect that water out of the wall. Um, and you'll also see in one of the case studies we'll touch upon in a second um, that this also has a similar principle as well. <laughs> the next thing you might need to consider as well with regards to how clay bricks operate and their characteristics is control joints. Obviously, as I mentioned, clay bricks are expansive in nature. They act like a sponge, which means that over time they will continue to expand at a very, very small rate. However, this means we need to account for that expansion. Um, obviously, as Jim mentioned before, hit and miss walls are often uh, created and designed in shorter spans, which means that control joints often aren't required. Um, and what you'll commonly see, like this uh, project in the bottom left, the Parrot Hills Community Hub with these lovely austral bricks, is that a control joint will be strategically placed at the end of the hit and miss brick wall. Um, Obviously, this is dependent on the look that you're going for, but in some scenarios, you may choose to section up your hit and miss wall with engaged piers or with a steel frame, and you may choose to, you know, purposely articulate your hit and miss wall with control joints. Um, and this is particularly if you have those longer spans of brickwork. So it comes down to the overall aesthetic decisions you want to make for your wall, but you can implement control joints either at the ends of your walls or you can choose to section it up in a way that can account for these. Obviously, this is dependent on the span length of your wall as well, um, as I believe control joints are only required at a minimum of every six metres in most scenarios. Um, I'm going to palm off to Jim here, um, and he's going to talk a little bit about the benefits. Um, if Jim is, if Jim's internet cuts out, I will take over and you'll have to put up with me for a bit longer. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. All right, evidently Jim is still having issues. Um, this is the, the life of the working from home. So I apologize everyone, you're going to have to put up with my voice for a little bit longer. <laughs> I think Jim's still here because he's just put out a poll on why you might use a hit and miss screen. Um, so thank you, Jim. But the first benefit that you might wanna look at is energy efficiency. So obviously hit and miss walls, as I've mentioned repeatedly, and as Jim mentioned, will allow for a bit of a block um, from high summer sun. So by using these hit and miss screens and these perforated brickwork, you'll allow for light to come into these spaces, but you'll actively provide shade um, from, these, from the high summer sun, which will obviously reduce space conditioning costs. So just as an example, um, this project Hatbox Place um, by Collins and Turner with Environa, They've used these really nice white austral bricks. However, this face, this uh, facade actually faces west and behind these windows are some small balconies um, and obviously windows into those balconies as well. And what they've actually done is to allow for that extra light whilst you know, not per per permitting the hot sun, they've created these hit and miss screens. So from an energy efficiency standpoint, you can use these to actively reduce costs for your house and help reach those sort of six star um, minimum uh, net matters targets. An additional benefit is privacy. Um, and this is particularly prudent uh, in urban applications. And this is where if you have a brick wall or a masonry system that is directly butting onto a street or a footpath, um, but you might still want to have light into that space. You might want to still have that interface between interior and exterior. So obviously you can see here, this is Gibbon Street Studio by Channon Architects. This project uh, is actually facing directly onto a laneway um, where cars drive and where people walk. 
And so what they've done is they've actually created this really long hit and miss screen with windows behind to create that sort of perforated lighting effect. Um, and you can take this one step further and, you know, use these screens uh, in front of a bathroom as well to sort of create that added privacy whilst allowing for natural light. And that's exactly what's been done here in the Waterloo House by Anthony Gill Architects. They've actually put a hit and miss wall in front of the bathroom. What they've also done is they've actually allowed vegetation to grow through the perforations in the brickwork. Um, and once again, allowing for vegetation growth in your house or in the sort of you know interior exterior spaces is going to create extra shading and filter oxygen which again is better from an energy efficiency perspective particularly in those warmer summer months and again a little bit of green in the house i think it just makes you feel better particularly if you're stuck inside that house for months at a time <laughs> Um, versatility, obviously hit and miss walls can be used in many applications as you've already seen. Um, they don't have to just be used as flat exterior feature walls. You can use them inside your house to separate spaces. You can use them uh, in, as well as with landscaping. And you can even use them in conjunction with textured walls. So you can you know, have a hit and miss screen followed by some corbelling, which creates a really nice textural richness. And as you can see here um, with the Rose House by Baracko and Wright, they've actually used these PGH bricks here and they've actually created a curved hit and miss wall. So it doesn't have to just be a flat uniform wall. You can get really creative with these. Um, and I believe this is, this is quite an advanced application of hit and miss walls, but it can look really great if you're trying to you know, create a feature space um, on your house or on your building. And lastly, and probably the most obvious, um, they can look great. The hit and miss walls are really unique. They're really visually striking. The minute you see one, your eyes are drawn to it. Um, and this house, the Jewel House by Karen Abernethy Architects, it's called this because at nighttime it sparkles like a jewel. Like you can just see the dappled light, that speckled glow coming from the building. So again, you can. it's not just about how the building looks and how it performs. It's sort of about how it makes you feel and the warmth that it creates and the unique look that it creates as well. Um, so now we're going to move on to a case study on the garden wall house. Um, Jim was going to take you through this, but I think I'll probably take you through it. Um, apologies once again. I know that my voice can be a little bit boring at some point, so I hope that I can keep you all cheered up and keep you all here. Um, so this is a high commendation in our Think Brick Awards in 2020. Um, this project uses these really nice grey PGH bricks and it's by Studio Bright. So a little bit about the site first. Um, this project was only four and a half metres wide, like a typical um, Sydney or Melbourne terrace. And it had garden walls running the length of the building, which created this really nice um, intimate courtyard space. And the architect really wanted to play off this intimate courtyard and have all of the focus be drawn um, towards creating views over this garden. Um, and what they eventually decided to do was use hit and miss brickwork to create this view out over the garden while still allowing for privacy um, and filtered light to come into the main bedroom in the upper levels. So you'll see here um, the beginning of the construction of this build. And you can, see, you can see how the actual bricks have started to be um, tested and laid for how this project might take shape. Um, it's worth noting that the actual hit and miss brickwork for this project does not contain any full perforations until about a quarter of the way up the upper volume. Um, and I'll show you why this is actually the case. So you can actually see um, the slab here between the ground floor and the first floor. And you can see that it's actually quite thick towards the back of the property. So what this means is that the architect wanted the illusion of the hit and miss wall to go all the way up that upper volume. And so what it means is they've got the actual perforations beginning about one quarter of the way up, which is what ultimately allows light to filter into the bedroom. And this window or this perforation actually faces east. 
Um, so it's perfect to allow that morning sunlight to actually just scatter into the bedroom there as well. So um, Peter asked a question about how the um, wall was actually supported, um, how the hit and miss wall for this project was supported. Um, and you can actually see the hit and miss wall beginning to take shape here. Um, and you can see these hidden structural steel frames running up and down the building um, and cleverly hidden behind the offset brickwork. So again, this is similar to what Jim mentioned before with these hidden steel frames. It gives the illusion of a really nice solid perforated wall um, from the outside, but you can again from the inside see, you know, what is doing the actual work um, to support this structure. It's a really nice sort of uh, cheeky way of hiding it as well. And again, you can sort of immediately see the dappled effect and the speckled effect of the light into the space. Um, and this might help to answer your question from before Tamara as well as to how you might clean these windows. If you sort of see in this photo, there's actually about a one metre or sort of yeah, 80, 80 centimetre gap between the actual windows of this build, um, which waterproof the house and between, between that and the hit and miss wall. So that actually acts as a sort of space that you can access, um, firstly, as a balcony, um, but secondly, as well, it grants access to that little recess space as well. And again, you can now see walls up and you can see privacy is a tick, natural lighting, also a tick. You can see just how awesome the shadows that these walls create are um, on these interior walls. And again, going back to the detailing that I mentioned before, um, as the wall only begins full perforations of one quarter of the way up the wall, there is still an opportunity to, for water to make its way through the bottom quarter of the hit and miss wall, um, which is why you can see these weep holes at the bottom of the upper volume. And this is ultimately in combination with flashing, what's going to allow water to be redirected out of the wall um, in the advent of rain or in the advent of needing um, to clean the windows as well. And here you can see the completed project um, looks great. Like you can see the emphasis drawn towards the garden here and you can see the interior shot. You can even um, see in this little cabinet, a little motif of the hit and miss wall um, within the bedroom itself, which is a nice little tie-in. But now we're gonna move on to an actual Think Brick Award winner. So this is the Gordon's Bay or GB house as it's more commonly referred to colloquially um, by Renato Diator Architects. Um, and this uses PGH bricks as well as Namoy Valley bricks. And this project won the residential award in 2019. Now, first of all, you can see immediately from this photo what the project's all about. Ultimately, the architect as well as the clients wanted to embody the spirit of seaside living. So you can see the site is perched atop a cliff overlooking Gordon's Bay. Um, and obviously this creates a bit of a challenge from a materiality standpoint. Um, so obviously what, when we've got a high saline environment, we need to think about what material is going to perform um, over the lifetime of the building. And brick was chosen as a perfect material um, because obviously we know how durable brick is and how, salt resi how resistant it is to salt attack. Um, and Phil asked, could the bottom row of the screen act as the necessary weep holes? Uh, in some cases it can, Phil, but in that project particularly, they had three, two or three courses of brickwork below the hit and miss wall. Um, so that would be why they've used the weep holes, similar to the earlier project that I referred to as well. So if your hit and miss wall goes all the way down to the ground, um, this can act as your weep holes. But if you have sealed stretcher bonded brickwork, you might need to integrate these weep holes to ensure the water redirects out of the wall. Um, so going back to GB House, they've actually selected these bespoke custom made terracotta breeze bricks. So the really interesting and unique thing about these bricks is that you'll notice they're white on three sides and they're orange on three sides or the natural sort of clay color on three sides. Um, and this was done on purpose. 
And you can see, again, they've actually horizontally exposed the cores as well um, in the way that they've laid these bricks, which is going to allow for additional perforations in your hit and miss wall. Um, and the reason they've actually gone for the different colours of the bricks is that the architect wanted to mimic the way the ocean dazzles in sunlight. So you can see in this photo on the left, the bricks actually sparkling in the sunlight, almost similar to how the turquoise waters below are sparkling. Um, conversely, in the interior, you can see the sort of natural warm clay colour illuminating the interior space. So it's a really nice juxtaposition between, you know, how the building responds to its exterior um, and how it responds in creating a really nice cozy atmosphere and warm atmosphere um, for the occupants of the house. When it comes to structural considerations, um, again, the long spans of this hit and miss brickwork meant that it would have to be divided up into discrete sections. Um, and you can see here, the way that they've actually stacked these bricks, um, they've actually almost got two bricks side by side, followed by a gap, followed by another two bricks side by side. And this creates a vertical plane in this hit and miss wall um, at every per pen joint, which actually allows for the steel frame to be hidden within the actual uh, hit and miss brickwork itself. Um, and a better photo of this, this is a slightly blurry photo, um, but you can see the actual steel support networks being inbuilt into the brickwork. And the ultimate aim of this is that you wouldn't be able to see the structural steel um, once all the brickwork had been built. So it's a clever way of hiding and concealing your structure. Uh, it's worth noting even in this really blurry grainy image how amazing the site still looks. Again, more structure. Um, we've also placed a window around the hit and miss brickwork in this photo. Um, and this actually acts as sort of a porthole to allow views over the ocean. So it allows users to walk out um, onto the breezeway that eventually forms part of this house and look out over the ocean. Um, and you can also see here, we've got bed joint reinforcing placed um, between different courses of the brickworks to further reinforce the hit and miss screen, particularly with these longer spans. And not to be forgotten, um, our good friend, the shelf angle, keeps popping his head up. And the shelf angles were again used where brickwork extended above a single floor. So you can see um, with these horizontally laid um, bricks, obviously going over into the first floor of the building, um, they've actually connected the shelf angle to the slab. And this ultimately supports the next level of brickwork. And again, this goes back into that idea of, you know, uh, allotting your brickwork into discrete segments um, to support them as discrete segments. And it makes life easier for the engineer as well. <laughs> and again, this is the completed hit and miss wall um, while the project's still being constructed. And you can see the contrast between views out of the building. You can see on that main living dining area, you've got these beautiful views out over the ocean. Um, and then above, you've almost got this sort of protected warming structure that sort of, you know, creates a really cozy, comfortable space and filters that light into the main living area. In terms of weatherproofing as well, um, obviously I've mentioned a few times, these walls are incredibly porous. They allow water in, which means we need to consider how we might seal the interior of the house. Um, you can see in this photo that actually uh, incorporated louvers into the design as weatherproofing windows. Um, and the idea behind this is that obviously louvers act like a bit of a hit and miss screen in themselves, whereas they can be manipulated and opened to allow for the airflow um, to flow into the building. And that allows the interior of the house to breathe, which was an important aspect the client was after. And you can again see um, highlighted in pink here, the actual breezeway that was created um, with these louvered windows. And again, this is what's going to allow access um, to not only the hit and miss wall, but also the windows themselves. Um, so that also helps with, you know, if you need to perform maintenance um, on the windows or the bricks themselves. And you can see in this really nice section image um, from the architect how the hit and miss 
screen filters the light into the space. Um, and from an energy efficiency standpoint, it's really important because one of the, this wall goes over two angles, um, but one facade of the hit and miss wall actually faces north. Um, and so obviously in warmer months, this is going to allow light into the space while still shielding it um, from that excessive summer sun. So it's a really clever way, again, of improving the energy efficiency of a building um, whilst looking great doing it. One final application of a hit and miss wall that you should consider, definitely, um, and it can be very effective if you have the means, uh, would of course be a wine cellar. Um, and I know that anyone that's been in, in lockdown for a particularly long time might be really wanting one of these. So if, if nothing else, uh, definitely consider a brick hit and miss screen to store those bottles of wine over the rest of lockdown. So this is the completed project. Um, you can see that really nice white subtle hit and miss wall overlooking Gordon's Bay. And again, uh, you can see this really nice warmth in the interior space. Um, so I think Jim's just released a poll. I think he's still there, which is really great. Um, which case study was your favorite? Let us know. Um, but on that, on that point, if you want to learn more about some really great case studies using different uh, brick techniques, please go and check out our website. We have case studies on a lot of different projects um, and how they've used bricks in some really creative ways. Um, as well as, as I mentioned at the start, um, our social media as well. Go and follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Spotify, um, all that good stuff. And go and listen to our Think Brick podcast. We actually have an episode specifically on hit and miss walls. Um, so please go and check that out as well as many other tech talks um, and many other uh, conversations with architects. Um, so just towards the end of the presentation now, I think Jim's going to release another poll on what you might want us to talk about in the next episode of the Think Brick webinar. We're trying to keep these run by you, the audience. We want to talk about what you're interested in. Um, so we've given a couple of different options for you to look at. Um, if what you're interested in isn't covered in this poll, I would encourage you to send myself or Jim an email. Um, our emails are on the screen right now down in the bottom right there. Um, I would encourage you to send us um, an email and let us know what you're interested in learning about. And we'll definitely integrate that into upcoming episodes. Um, but yeah, getting towards the end here, final thing, make sure to you know follow us on these socials. We're always posting great stuff, not only on hit and miss walls, but you know, different, really interesting buildings. We've also got our Think Brick Awards coming up later in the year. So keep an eye out for to see who's going to win those. Um, and once again, I'd just like to emphasize that we're all about knowledge sharing. Um, we're all about, you know, checking out how we can use bricks in different ways to sort of create some really inspiring architecture. Um, and Luke's just messaged in the chat. Um, Luke works for Ancon, who, if you don't know, supply a lot of the structural elements to help support um, some really crazy, cool and wonderful brickwork. I would highly recommend you check out their website. Um, if you see on the screen in the bottom left right now, um, that's a project in Melbourne that I believe Ancon actually worked at. And I believe AM60 also used some of their uh, products as well. So again, if you're after a bit of, inf a bit of additional information, would definitely um, follow that link that Luke's posted in the chat because I know they do some really great work um, on some really awesome projects. Um, but finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for sticking by, um, even with a couple of the technical glitches we've had today. Um, and I'd encourage you all to look out for our next episode, which will be the last Wednesday in October. Um, so we're going to take into account some of the feedback um, from what you want to see us cover in the next episode. And we hope to actually integrate that uh, into the next episode. And once again, um, if you have any projects that you think are really interesting, have used some really cool products, um, some really cool designs, I would encourage you again to get in contact with us via email and um, you know send us a few pictures and give us a bit of an explanation as to what was achieved 
and we're more than happy to feature them um, in subsequent episodes. Um, so finally, from me and from Jim as well, even if he's not here, I think the ghost of Jim is here. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining, and I wish you all uh, safety in the next couple of weeks and hope you all stay safe and have a great west rest of the week. Uh, thank you. I will stay on for the next couple of minutes to answer any questions um, that anyone might have in the chat as well. And an additional thank you for everyone for putting up with my voice for 45 minutes or so straight. <laughs> a few thanks and thumbs up. Thanks, everyone. Just taking a big sip of water. <laughs> thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Hagop. Might just click back a slide. I'll leave my email and Jim's email on the slide there as well in case anyone wants to jot that down. Ah, oh, thanks, Tamara. Thank you for the questions as well. Thank you for staying engaged and, you know, challenging us as well a bit. It's, it's good to see some great knowledge sharing um, for these really interesting projects. And we hope to see more of them over the next few years as well. Definitely in next year's Think Brick Awards. Thanks, Luke. And yes, definitely anyone looking to use some really great, um, you know, products with any interesting designs, any, if you need any structural help or any, you know, shelf angles and whatnot to help support some really cool projects, Ancon and Luke, definitely, definitely the guy to get in contact with. They've worked on some great projects that have won the Think Brick Awards in the past. So, you know, if you have some wacky designs that you're not sure how to work out, I'm sure that they'll have a solution. They haven't failed anyone yet, to my knowledge. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Peter. All right, I think if there's no other questions, I might close up the session in a minute. Uh, Jim, if you're still here, do you want a message in the chat? I think you might have to close the session. Mm. 